It is typical for humans to become accustomed to something and therefore to take it for granted. As an example, I've never really lived without indoor plumbing or running water or a furnace. Of course, I've gone backpacking, but that doesn't count because that was willing. But I don't really think about it very often that I can just turn a switch and I've got potable water. You know, one of the things that I think as Americans that we may take for granted is a right that we have. And this right that was built into our founding documents is so significant that throughout most of the history of the world, people have not had this right. And in fact, even right now, most countries don't have this right that we have. And the Founding Fathers wouldn't say that they were giving us this right. They would recognize that this right comes from God, and they're simply affirming it. And the right of which I speak is found in the First Amendment. Of course, in that First Amendment, we have the freedom um, to uh, peaceably gather, uh, freedom of press, uh, freedom um, of religion. But the one of which I am speaking is where it makes the statement that our government will make no law abridging the freedom of speech, that we have a right to say just about whatever we want to say, and throughout much of history and throughout much of the world right now, individuals do not have that right, and it's something for which we ought to be thankful. I bring this up because in this passage of Scripture, as we look at Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 4, Jesus is going to bring up the topic of speech. There is a power structure that exists in this world, and Jesus has warned us about them. He has challenged them. He has shamed them to their faces, and now he's telling his disciples, they are going to try to tell you what you can and cannot say, and you must resist that. So let's see what happens. We're in Luke chapter 12, Starting with verse 4, the context here is that Jesus is in the middle of his Judean ministry. The cross is mere months away. Jesus has confronted the Pharisees with their corrupt religious and political leadership. He's called them out. He's challenged his disciples, be aware of these people. They are corrupt. But beginning in verse 4, he's going to tell us something about how we would use our speech. So here we are, Luke chapter 12, verse 4 from the ESV. He says to them and therefore to us, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more of more value than many sparrows. Verse 8. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, Do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Jesus immediately warns his disciples, and therefore us, that we're not to fear those individuals or power structures or groups that can kill the body. This is, of course, a reference to the very power structure that would take Jesus' life in a matter of months. Now, just to be clear, he's not talking about a biological fear response. There's nothing wrong or sinful about experiencing fear that is human. But what he's talking about is making decisions based upon fear. This group of people says, you do not speak that name of Jesus or we're going to kill you. What he's saying is you can't make your decision based upon being afraid. He goes on to say that we should indeed fear someone, not who has the ability to kill us, but fear the one who has the ability to cast us into hell. Now, to whom is Jesus referring here? 
Who has the power to cast people into hell? Well, it's more palatable for us to think that Jesus is referring to the enemy. But the enemy has no such power. Contrary to popular belief, Satan does not rule hell. He will not rule hell. He will suffer there as a participant, not as a leader. The only person who has the power to separate the wheat from the weeds, the sheep from the goats, and to determine someone's eternity is the Lord himself. Jesus says, don't fear the Pharisees whose only power is the ability to kill you. Fear the God who has the power over your eternity. If you're going to fear something, fear him. Now, these are difficult statements to hear, but these are the words of our Lord and we must deal with them. And just in case that we begin to feel like, well, man, God seems pretty rough. I I don't know. How much does he even care for us? Jesus switches topics, and he uses an analogy about sparrows. Sparrows apparently were captured, bred, bought, and sold in this culture. And of course, you might ask, are these African or European sparrows? I know not. But the price for these sparrows was two pennies. That's about 15 bucks in our culture. In other words, these were cheap, the cheapest animals that you could buy. They didn't have goldfish back then. And yet the Lord cares even for them. And then he goes on to say, how much more will he care for us because we are worth more than many sparrows? So he wants us to know as we discuss this topic that he does care for us. He has the power over our eternity, but he does care for us. We must be careful then not to reject him in fear. And so the next section, Jesus challenges his disciples on their use of words. How are they going to speak when it comes to the truth of the scripture? Are they going to deny or confirm the Messiah when pressure is on them? And the implication is that this corrupt power structure, the the men who are Pharisees and scribes and lawyers that they are going to pressure Jesus' followers into rejecting him, into publicly denying him. It is here that Jesus makes possibly one of the more difficult statements in the New Testament. He tells us, verse 10, that if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. This is one of those rare instances when we must break basic interpretation or hermeneutical rules. Remember, that your best bet when interpreting the scripture is to take it at face value. They call this a straightforward reading. And what it means is is if, if any just common person were to look at this sentence and read it, what would they think it meant? And we call that a straightforward reading. But sometimes we need to adjust for cultural context or genre or literary device. As an example, Jesus said in John 14 that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that's a very narrow statement. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, Jesus. Are there any literary devices? No. Is there cultural context? Is there any genre issues? No. It's a, it's a plain statement, and we have to interpret it as such. However, Jesus would also say that if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If he's being literal, I would be blind. This is a literary device called hyperbole. It's an exaggeration to drive home a point. So we don't think that Christians ought to literally gouge their eyes out. The communication he's trying to make is that we should take extreme measures to avoid sinning against the Lord. So how then do we interpret this phrase? Because if we just take the straightforward reading, it seems to be rather troubling and it contradicts the rest of Scripture. Now, remember, the one who says that we shouldn't take this as a straightforward reading must bear the burden of proof. And so if I'm going to say to you, this is what it says, but it means something different, that I have to prove that to you. If this statement is to be taken at face value, then we have some difficulties. Christians could blaspheme the Holy Spirit and lose their salvation in an instant. If it is unforgivable, then it couldn't be undone. You speak a single phrase, and then you're done forever. That's if this is to be taken at face value. The other problem is that a straightforward reading goes against the full counsel of Scripture. 
In other words, the cross of Christ was not sufficient to cover all sins. It covered most sins. If we take a straightforward reading, then Paul would have some problems when he said this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgive, forgiven us how much all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So we would have to tell Paul, say to Paul, look, he forgives us, and he nailed all of our sins to the cross except for one. If we take this as a straightforward reading, then John would have a hard time saying this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. If we take this as a straightforward reading, then John the Baptist couldn't really say this. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If we take this as a straightforward reading, Jesus himself was wrong when he taught many things about going before the Lord and having forgiven us, having forgiven us for our debts. All that to say that there must be some nuance here in what Jesus is saying, some problem with translation, some kind of nuance in the Greek. And so we're left to kind of figure out what are some possibilities as to what he means. Well, the first thing that we can do is we can look at context. The context here is that we are to be aware of the Pharisees. These are rich, powerful, and corrupt leaders. And that we shouldn't fear those who can kill, and the implication is that they have the ability to put you to death. And that we're not to deny Jesus before them, that is, with social pressure or legal pressure or threat of death. And so a reasonable understanding is that when Jesus uses the word blaspheme, what he means here is blaspheme in the sense of rejecting. That it's not just the simple words, it's that the intention behind the words is to reject the Holy Spirit. And so if you reject the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you have rejected the Word of God and the work of God. And so in the context, it, uh, it refers to fear of the people and the structures who would ridicule, imprison, or, in ki or kill you for following Jesus. That person will not be forgiven because they have rejected the work of God. But we have another problem. If a person confesses Jesus as Lord and truly becomes a Christian, would we say that if that person rejects Jesus under threat of death, that they have then lost their salvation? Well, this is where we need to turn to systematic theology. We need to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Was there any case of a follower of Jesus who publicly rejected Jesus and then was forgiven? And the answer is, yes, we do. It was Peter. Consider the events after the arrest. Luke 22, Peter is in public, and he blatantly rejects his involvement in the ministry of Jesus and claims to have never met the man. If to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject the Holy Spirit under duress, then Peter should not be forgiven ever, and yet he was. And so clearly, simply rejecting the Holy Spirit cannot be unforgivable. So what is the answer? The only answer that fits all of the puzzle pieces is that when Jesus says this, he's referring to the ultimate blasphemy, the ultimate rejection of the Holy Spirit. That is, a non-Christian person rejects the Holy Spirit and therefore is not forgiven because they don't have the Spirit living within them. This is a complex way of saying that when a person confesses Jesus Christ as Lord, the Spirit comes into their life and they are forgiven. And when a person rejects Jesus as Lord, the Holy Spirit has not come in and they have not been forgiven. And in that sense, they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Now, you might say, well, why couldn't Jesus have used clearer language? Well, we can only guess, but we do know that a person's words often reflects their values and their beliefs. And so if a person is going to curse out and blaspheme and reject the work of God, it's probably because it reflects the actual reality of their hearts. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject Jesus as Lord and not allow the Spirit of God into your life. And in that status, you will not be forgiven. So here is the summary. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit cannot just mean mere words. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit does not mean just rejecting Jesus under duress, but it does mean the ultimate rejection of the work of God.
Now, with that out of the way, I want to move on, and I want to look at what do we do with this passage, because Jesus seems very concerned about the words that we're going to use, the words that we're going to use to either affirm things or reject things. And so the first thing we must understand is that there is such a thing as God-honoring speech, and that our speech is central. That our speech is not unimportant, it's not accidental, that what we say does in fact matter. Because our speech validates a truth, it confirms a belief. In fact, speech is part of becoming a Christian. Look what Paul says in Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We use our mouth to publicly declare that Jesus is my Lord, I abandon myself, I repent of my lifestyle, and I call upon him as my Savior. And when we say it, it brings a sense of reality. And if we're not willing to say it, Did it truly happen? You know, when the Lord was creating the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1, how did he do it? He spoke it into existence. We don't have words of power. We can't name it and claim it, and yet our words matter. When we go before the Lord and we confess our sin to him out loud, there is a release. There is a uh, a release of guilt and the weight of what we have done. And with our words, we can tear people down and we can build them back up. And so in the Christian life, what we say and what we don't say is central. And what we find is that God has, in fact, instituted compelled speech. He has said that if you're going to follow me, There are things that I want you to say. What is this compelled speech? Well, we know that we're to confess Jesus as Lord, that we're to pray. And of course, not all prayer is out loud, but some of it is. That we're to encourage one another, that we're to speak truth, that we're to speak against injustices, that we're to speak the gospel, and that we are, in fact, to uh, to confess Jesus as Lord even under duress. So as we think about that the Lord is Lord of our mouths, he's Lord of our speech, he has commanded us, compelled us to speak these things. But he has also instituted prohibited speech. There are things that he doesn't want us to say. As an example, he doesn't want us to blasphemy. He doesn't want us to take the Lord's name in vain. He doesn't want to gossip or slander. He doesn't want any coarse joking. He doesn't want immoral speech. He doesn't want false witnesses according to the Ten Commandments or lying or denying Jesus. And so this is the Lord's standard of our speech. In this passage, Jesus wants his disciples to know that what they say matters. And the power structure of the day is going to try to compel you to reject the things that God wants you to say and to say the things that he doesn't want you to say. And the warning is that God's standards of speaking and the world's standards of speaking are different and they are going to collide because they are at odds with one another. And so we must decide as Christians, what are we going to say and what are we not going to say? Are we going to be pressured by the world or are we going to obey God? And so I want to take a moment to critique world-honoring speech meaning the world has a way that they want us to speak. And we find this all the way back in the history of the Bible. There's a story about the prophet Amos, and he was speaking judgment against the nation of Israel because the nation was in rebellion against God. Commanded the prophets saying, you shall not prophesy. In other words, there was a power structure that said, we do not want to hear from God. You're not allowed to prophesy. You're not allowed to talk about the Ten Commandments. You're not allowed to talk about God or any of this stuff. Keep your mouth shut. Do not bring up God into this argument. We find the same thing in Jeremiah. Preaching on how the people have broken the covenant, he said, the man of Anathoth who seek your life and say, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord or you will die by our hand. In other words, you do not mention the things of God or we're going to kill you. And this, of course, happened in the New Testament. Peter, James, and John, they're before the courts. They've been arrested. They've been thrown in prison. 
And look what Luke records in the book of Acts. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and then charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. You're not allowed to talk about this stuff. You, you can't mention that name or we will kill you. You see, our world has the same thing that God has. God has compelled speech, things that he wants us to say, and he has prohibited speech, things that he doesn't want us to say, and our world has the same thing. Our world has things that the world wants you to say and then things that it doesn't want you to say. Let's talk about some of these in ascending significance. Uh, the, the first one that is going to afflict us over the next couple of weeks is the whole Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays things. I was... Um, volunteering with my company because we do, um, you know, when you ring the little bell out in front of the store. And, and so we're just volunteering. And I'm with this gal. She's another agent with me and we're there. And I don't know what she believes. I don't think she's, you know, attending church or anything, but she's not uh, against faith or anything like that. But we're just out there ringing the bell. People are dropping in, in dollars and um, someone drops in some money and she says, happy holidays. And the guy turns around. And he's like, Merry Christmas. But I remember, you know, saying Merry Christmas to someone a couple years ago, and they got visibly angry. And I could tell they were trying to hold their tongue. And they're like, happy winter solstice. <laughs> it's like, wow, you just can't make people happy with whatever you say here. But, you know, there was a, a case a few years back of a law enforcement shooting where a woman ended up dead. And there was this whole movement where people were saying that you need to say her name. Now, I'm not going to comment on the case because that's not what's relevant to me. But I will tell you this. Whenever something happens, a wise and discerning Christian will step back and say, I'm going to make a judgment on this, but I'm going to follow the scripture. Proverbs 18:17. And various other verses will talk about how we are to be wise judges, discerning judges, that we are to gather the facts. And at the end of the story, then we make a decision on whether this was good or bad. And so I don't, I'm not necessarily concerned, but there were, there were mobs of people going around saying, you have to repeat this slogan. What, what are we talking about? Whose name? What are we talking about? You say it right now. And I'm just not going to be compelled by a mob to say a political slogan, even if it's true, I don't know at that time. I'm not going to be bullied into saying a phrase of which I, I know nothing about. And then, of course, we've been hearing that words can be described as violence. There was a, 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 an altercation with someone speaking at a college, and a college professor gets up and says, words are violence. Jesus is Lord. That's, that's violence against me. And then, of course, we have restrictions of free speech on certain platforms. And there's a decent chance that when this message is done and it's been recorded and posted online, that it will be flagged as hate speech. And then, of course, we have the concept of hate speech. Do you know that this book right here is functionally illegal in 52 countries? In some places in the world, if you tout this, it's because you are a hater because you're a bigot, and you, the names go on and on. The, speech, the, the gospel is already hate speech in some Western countries, and we've seen high-profile arrests of preachers in both Canada and the UK for simply saying what the Scripture says. And so we are faced with a situation where the world wants us to say some things and not say some things, and then God says, no, you are to say these things and not say these things, and what are we going to do? And of course, this is the biggest battle, this is the biggest one, and this is the one that will get you fired, deplatformed, marginalized, and in some places, arrested. The biggest verbal battle right now that our culture faces is the battle of pronouns. Now, until about 10 minutes ago, and I'm, I'm joking, it's about five years ago, this type of thing was rare. Transgenderism was rare, and you might find this offensive, but it was considered to be a mental disorder. How dare you say that? It's in the medical journals. About five years ago, they started slowly deleting it. People were given psychological help, and the scientific community understood the binary nature of gender. 
However, recently, it's become a social contagion. It's a denial of mammalian biology. They believe that gender is purely a social construct. And right now, last I checked, there are over 70 confirmed genders. And we must both physically and chemically alter children who suffer from this, or this disorder. And the concept has devolved so far into people actually identifying as dogs or cats or aliens. Now, if you don't believe me, get on TikTok. Actually, don't get on there. But I've seen videos out there, and the belief is that you must use their preferred pronouns, and if you don't, you hate them, and you're going to be a complicit in their suicide. So in other words, if I don't play along with their denial of reality, then I'm a bigot, a hater, and a transphobe, and I will cause untold suffering and death. You must use your words in this way. And yet, the scripture says some things that are so offensive It says from Genesis, from the very beginning, that God made them male and female. Jesus would later confirm and quote Genesis, God made them male and female. In the Old Testament, the strongest word for sin was the word abomination. And it was used to describe someone who purposefully cross-dressed. The scripture talks about Marriage only being between a man and a woman, and that all sexual activity outside of a marriage is a sin before the Lord. So there are some things here that are countercultural, and people will hate you for saying what I just said. Say this stuff and see where it gets you. But see, here's the issue. The Lord is the Lord of my speech. Now, I mess up all the time, but he's the Lord of my speech, and I'm not going to be compelled to regurgitate someone's political slogan unless I agree with it, and I'm not going to be compelled to participate in someone's fantasy because they happen to believe something that is a denial of reality. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to use my words, and it's not an act of love to go with them on that fantasy. It's not an act of love to play along. And by the way, even our secular society is beginning to turn on this issue. We're starting to see mainstream media outlets questioning some of these barbaric practices. And since this is all new, we're starting to see the first round of what will be years of lawsuits against doctors, hospitals, and therapists who led young people into these irreversible medical decisions. And my point in bringing all this up is that I am not going to allow our culture to dictate my speech. Friends, compelled speech almost always involves a denial of reality. Because if it was with reality, you wouldn't have to enforce it. If you walked outside and said, yeah, the the trees are green. Oh, yeah, of course, the trees are green. Who's going to reject that? But if I walked outside and they said the the trees are purple, they're green. No, they're purple. But they look green. You can't say that. They're purple or we're going to fire you. Almost all compelled speech is compelled because it's a denial of reality. So what do we do? What do we do with all of this? I'm only bringing up the current issues because if our Christianity doesn't bleed into all areas of our life, then what's the value in it? But the first thing is that the Lord is calling us to submit our speech to him. And we ought to place our fear properly. And Jesus, we go back to what he says in verse 4, that we shouldn't fear the structures who will punish us for our words. Rather, we ought to fear the one who determines our eternity. So don't be afraid of the world getting mad at you because you're using a figure of speech that is offensive. Fear the one who determines your eternity. The second thing is that we ought to practice speech resistance in preparation for the future. You see, as time goes on, as culture changes, we are increasingly going to be told that what we teach is wrong, that it's immoral, that it's bigoted, that it's hateful, and just like the Sanhedrin, you are not allowed to say or teach or talk about this person whose name is Jesus. And I would say that we need to start practicing this right now, because we we give a little, we back up, we back up, we back up, and we're going to create a habit. And I just want to Make sure that what I'm saying honors the Lord now, however mad someone gets. Do you know that 
some years ago, I went through and I studied the entire New Testament. I read through all of it, and I was asking the question, what do people most often pray for? Because I wanted to know, what does the, the scripture teach? Now, if you go to most American prayer meetings, at the top of the list, it's going to be so-and-so is sick and so-and-so is traveling. Those are going to be like the number one things prayed for in most prayer groups. And in the scripture, we do see that, but they're at the bottom. The number one prayer priority, the thing that is most often prayed for in the New Testament was power, courage, and boldness in speaking. It was so important that you go through and you categorize every prayer prayed, and the most common prayer was, Lord, give me the courage, the boldness, and power to use my words. And so if the mob comes for us, we must not change our speech. If you're a Christian, we do not reject him under pressure. If the, a boss threatens to fire us, we don't change our speech. If we are deplatformed, we don't change our speech. If we are arrested, we must not change our speech. If we are threatened with death, we must not change our speech. He is the Lord of how we talk. And Peter said it best after being threatened by the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than men. Now, I know this is kind of heavy stuff. And you might think, I don't want to get thrown in jail. What am I going to do? Well, at the very end of the story in verses 12, 11 and 12, he tells us that he's going to provide for us during this persecution. He says, you get dragged before the court, you get thrown in prison, and they're going to ask you to speak. Don't worry about it. I've got you covered. The Holy Spirit is going to work something miraculous in your life. And he will give you the words to say. Now, why is Jesus so strict on this? Why, why is Jesus so concerned about what we say? Well, one reason is that he's concerned about the truth. But the other reason is, and this is, I think, the primary thing, that God loves people. You take these teenagers who were locked into their rooms for a year. And the only access to the outside world was through their phones and through TikTok and Zoom and whatever it might be. And you have teenagers that, that don't have parents that are around. They've been taught that, you know, hey, you, you just, you're an accident, you're, you're an animal that's evolved, and when you die, you're dead, and that's it. So I'm locked in my room. I don't necessarily have parents. I don't have friends. I don't have family. I don't have any purpose. I don't know where I come from. I don't know where I'm going. What is the meaning with all of this? And we wonder that young people fall into despair and they say, hey, maybe it's because you don't know who you are. Maybe if we give you these drugs, maybe if we give you the surgery, you'll feel better. The reason we speak is because God loves people and he knows that the greatest thing that we can do to bring satisfaction, to bring comfort, to bring purpose to our lives is to connect with our creator. It is with him. It is through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross and a relationship with God that we will find ultimate satisfaction. So God loves people and we must speak the gospel into a dark culture. Because the culture is going to do everything it can to try to find satisfaction, to try to find peace, to try to find some meaning, and they're not going to find it. It's a poisoned and empty well. And so here we are with the truth of the gospel that God loves them, and if they will come to him, if they will abandon themselves, repent of their sins, uh, uh, confess him as Lord, then they will have life, and they will have it abundantly. The Apostle John was the last member of the era of the New Testament. All of the apostles were, were killed, martyred. He was the last one who actually met Jesus, saw Jesus, saw his death and his resurrection. Well, before he died, he had a disciple by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp never saw Jesus, but he knew John who did. So Polycarp represents the next generation of the early church. Polycarp became a regional leader in the church, and as the Romans were ratcheting up their persecution, why? Because they would not with their lips honor Caesar as Lord. 
So they were trying to find Polycarp so that they could put him down. And there were some slave boys that knew where he was. And the slave boys wouldn't turn him in. So they took these two boys, they're like 12 to 15 years old, and they tortured them. Until the, the, the slave boys gave up Polycarp's location. The Romans, uh, you know, sent their stormtroopers or whatever, the KGB, uh, to his uh, little country villa. And they surrounded the house. And Polycarp invited them and said, come on in, guys. Sit down. Let's eat. Let's drink. And they were taken aback. And they said, well, we don't, we don't really want to kill you. But we have to because you're not willing to give honor to the emperor. And he says, if you're going to arrest me, can I just pray for an hour? And they let him pray, and then they finally took him to the authorities. And the authorities were like, hey, we don't want to kill you. You're a nice guy. You're 86 years old. Everyone seems to love you. Just give honor to Caesar, and everything will go away. Can you hear the temptation even today? Just say this phrase, and everything will be fine. Before his death... This is what Polycarp said, and we have a record of his words. Eighty-six years I have served him, and he has never done me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my God who has saved me? And so my challenge to all of us, the challenge from the Scripture to all of us, is are we going to use our speech to honor the crowd or to honor the Creator? And those are not the same things. And so we must choose today. 